Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Stay awake. Okay? Otherwise, I will uh, fall asleep. I'm going to talk for 45 minutes about managing your critical knowledge assets. And you may say, what does that mean? What are critical knowledge assets? And Larry challenged us this morning, and he said, you can't measure knowledge. I agree. Many argue you can't manage knowledge. I tend to agree. My challenge to you is this. You can't measure knowledge, but you can measure knowledge assets. You can't manage knowledge, but you can manage knowledge assets. At least that's what I'm going to claim. I may delight you, I may horrify you. You can challenge me about this. I come from Cambridge, UK. Uh, my company is based in St. John's Innovation Centre, Cambridge. And I teach what's called knowledge asset management in at King's College, Cambridge. It's an aspect, it's an approach to knowledge management. There are many approaches to knowledge management. And your organizations and you need to decide what's right for you. A question was just asked about personal knowledge management. Over the three days, I'm going to talk about three different things. On day three, I'm going to present a framework which talks about personal knowledge management, team knowledge management, organizational knowledge management, inter-organizational knowledge management, and even global knowledge management. It depends on the context. It depends on the nature of your organization. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. And also, I'm going to talk on day three about the development of global knowledge management standards. I've been working with the International Standards Organization and with the British Standards Organization ooh, for the last, since 2000, the last 17 years. And initially, we didn't think we could develop a standard when I worked with this in 2000 to 2003, we felt it's such a rapidly developing discipline. The approaches are evolving by the day. The processes, the strategies, the technologies are changing so fast. You can't have a standard. By the time you have a standard, it's out of date. So at that time, we said no. In 2015, we tried again with a group of 30 experts around the globe, and we finished the draft document, which I'll share with you on Wednesday. But today, I want to challenge you and think about managing your critical knowledge assets. Because the first thing I want to say to you is that it's absolute madness to manage every piece of knowledge in your organization. It would explode. It's stupid to try to encourage people to capture stuff and put it in technologies like SharePoint. I'm not going to say is meaningless. I'm going to say without focus is meaningless. And I've seen quite a lot of different approaches. We're a group of consultants that um, are based around the world. Uh, we're a small group, but we have a global perspective. And you know, the consultants that we have in Tokyo, in Japan, have a completely different approach to knowledge than some of us in the West. 
They have concepts about knowledge spaces, which are called bar, which really are quite deep and quite rich, if you understand them. There are different approaches. There's a different approach, I would suggest, in the US to knowledge. Uh, and in certain parts of Europe, particularly in Scandinavia, it's very, very process-oriented as well. So there are different approaches, and I'm hoping I can try to share with you some of those approaches. But the first thing I want to say to you is that although we are so-called experts, and Larry and I have this discussion m many times, if anybody tells you they're an expert in knowledge management and know everything there is to know about knowledge management, run away as fast as you can, because we're all learning all the time. And what I'd like to do tomorrow, if I can, is talk a little bit about what was briefly mentioned this morning. Big, big data, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning. What impact will these technologies have on knowledge management? The World Economic Forum are challenging us that the fourth industrial revolution with all these new technologies is actually redefining what we mean by being human. To what degree are we going to work with machine intelligence? Already today we're working with what we call cobots. And to what degree will that intelligence um, work with humans, against with humans, for humans? The ethical considerations are fascinating and highly challenging. But let's concentrate today on managing your critical knowledge assets. I'm going to share with you a methodology that was developed together with the European Commission. It was a 2 million euro research, collaborative research project. Our company was involved, INSEAD Business School was involved, Ernst & Young was involved, the German Artificial Intelligence um, Institute was involved, advanced learning. And we developed a methodology because, as has just been said, up until the point of that research, there was actually two camps in knowledge management that were fighting one another. There was the HR camp saying, it's about people. Knowledge management's about people. It's not about technology. That's an enabler. And then you have the IT people saying, without this, you haven't got the global reach. You can't do the sharing. You can't do it without the technology. And they were actually fighting one another at that time. And we thought, this is rather crazy, you know. There are some assets here. There are some human. People are the greatest knowledge assets. That we all agree with, whether you come from the, H, the people approach or the IT approach. People are our greatest knowledge assets. Always will be. Knowledge is changing every day in the organization. What's important is the knowledge that is critical to try to capture and retain and transfer and amplify for the benefit of others. People are our greatest knowledge assets, but so are the technologies. Let's not belittle them. They have a tremendous role to play. And we need to not be fighting, but actually working together in a more holistic approach. This is what this methodology attempts to do. Now, I am not a nuclear expert. I, I know nothing about the nuclear industry. But I do understand the principles of effective knowledge management. And I have had the privilege of implementing these principles in just about every industry sector you can think of, including energy. But I'm not pretending to be an expert on nuclear. Um, but I was invited, first of all, to speak together with our other speakers here, Larry and Ashok. In Russia last year, in April, it was with Ross Atom, who was holding a nuclear knowledge management conference. And we went and we, we talked. And then I was invited to the IAEA conference, which was in November last year in Vienna. So I'm getting to know quite a bit about nuclear. But uh, 
it's the principles that I'm really uh, interested in. And I would put to you that the principles are just as applicable in nuclear as they are in healthcare, as they are in any other industry sector, if we're principles led. To explain what knowledge asset management is, I need to tell you my story and how it evolved. And basically for me it started in 1998, when I was asked by the UK government to be part of a team to develop a white paper. And that white paper was called Building a Knowledge Driven Economy. And that was because the UK was in big trouble. The UK could not and cannot today compete with other countries of the world on labor costs. Particularly Asia and other countries, we just could not compete. Our productivity and our manufacturing was going down and down and down. And our government was worried about this and wanted to know what we had to do to match that. And the conclusion was we don't match that. The conclusion was that there is something even more valuable that we should focus on and develop a national strategy. And that was on knowledge, creativity, innovation. That's where we can compete. And that's where I first got involved with national knowledge management. Knowledge being the key asset. If you think about it deeply enough, I'm sure you will agree, knowledge underpins everything we do. All of our business activities if you think deeply enough, it's underpinned by knowledge. But there are two types of knowledge in a business. There's operational knowledge. And how can we improve the way we do things around here? How can we improve our productivity? That's good. Continual improvement, essential for any organizational, operational. But there's another type of knowledge, which is what knowledge asset management is about which is strategic knowledge management. Focusing on knowledge as a strategic asset, not just a resource, a strategic asset. You might say that an organization that focuses just on operational knowledge management recognizes that knowledge is an important resource. What we call those knowledge-based organizations. Knowledge is a key, important resource to be managed. For those organizations where their paradigm is that knowledge is not just important, knowledge is the key strategic asset that drives our organization, we call them knowledge-driven. So we make a distinction between knowledge-driven being strategic and knowledge-based being operational, and you need both. You need both. Uh, knowledge asset management happens to focus on being knowledge driven, strategic. And much of that came from initial thinking, how can we actually look at knowledge as a strategic asset for the UK initially? I then got involved with the British Standards Institute in 2000. And I chaired the committee to create the knowledge management standard. And we all thought that what that meant was to have a collection of the best practices and share the best practices. There's nothing wrong in that. That's good, isn't it? We do that all the time. Problem is, it doesn't do much for the mindset. If you have best practices, then you feel that if you've achieved what others have achieved, you've actually succeeded. So we change that rapidly from best practices to good practices, which means not only do we want to achieve what others are achieving, we want to exceed it. It's a different mindset. So we decided that it was wrong at that time to develop standards, but instead we would provide guidances and good practices was one of them. And then in 2003, we developed knowledge asset management as a methodology from the European Commission. If you're interested, 
I'm glad to say the book is still available on Amazon. All of the research proceedings are published there. Uh, our thinking behind it, uh, what you can manage, what you can measure, how you focus on the critical knowledge, and how you can report on that. I'll go into that in a moment, just give you a brief introduction to it. But just to continue the story a little further to the current date, it went a bit quiet on after that uh, standards work and after the development of the methodology. But I got involved in 2007 with the Asian Productivity Organization. They were established 55 years ago and their secretariat is based in Tokyo. All of the Asian countries are members of the Asian Productivity Organization. And I've had the privilege in working in all of them. And it's extraordinary to see the different approaches to knowledge just across the Asian countries. And the mission of the Asian Productivity Organization is to increase the productivity of Asia. And they've done a great job. They've brought in methods, tools, and techniques to do that. But the reason I got involved with them is we recognized there is something more important than just increasing physical productivity. And that is what we call knowledge productivity. Increasing the productivity of knowledge. We're actually pretty bad at it right now. I, I, I would challenge us to say that in just 20 years, if not 10 years, we will look back and see how much we've advanced. Professor Peter Drucker was mentioned this morning. I like his book, Post-Capitalist Society, where he said that the, ch the greatest contribution of management in the 20th century was to increase the productivity of manual working 50-fold. Great achievement through management science. What he went on to say was that the greatest contribution management and leadership need to make in the 21st century is to increase the productivity of knowledge work. We're pretty bad at it right now, but we're, we're, we're advancing at exponential rates almost. And this is what we've been doing in, with the Asian Productivity Organization over the last eight years. We have produced a variety of books, and the reason I'm showing you them here is so that you can add them to your resources because they're completely free of charge. You can download any or all of these books from the APO website, which is shown in the bottom right-hand corner, APO. And that's got everything. What is knowledge management, a facilitator's guide, it's got case studies, it's got manuals of tools and techniques. It's even got a book that we developed called K uh, Knowledge Management for SMEs, not just for large organizations, but for small and medium size. And we were actually told that the management didn't want to hear any terminology at all. It had to be in ordinary, everyday language. Knowledge management for the public sector. The public sector has its own culture, you know. Culture is one of the most important things. If we stay with Professor Peter Drucker, he's famous for saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. We all know what that means. It's the most powerful part of the organization. You can have tremendous tools, techniques, and strategies, but with the wrong culture, forget it. We also have developed the book, Knowledge Productivity in the Public Sector, which is about to be published any day now. So they're great resources that you could look at. But I'm mentioning, mentioning it because it all led up to a realization that if we look at knowledge assets and the way we manage them, that is what is going to be the real strength. Let me draw your attention to a couple of other papers. You might be interested in this one. In January 2015, Harvard produced a paper, Managing Your Mission Critical Knowledge. 
It comes from a couple of people at Wharton Business School. And that's really good in itself. I won't spend much time on it now because you can Google it and you can download the paper and it shows you their approach to identifying what is critical, how do we identify it, how do we manage it, how do we measure it. And we're talking about knowledge assets which I'll come on to define in a moment. A very important part of uh, the approach towards looking more strategically at knowledge. The approach that I teach, that I'm coming on to now, we teach it at Cambridge, and basically the good news is the universities, this is the last one that's accepted it in Cambridge, Anglia Ruskin, now have recognized it and accredited it as modules as part of an MBA program. So it's starting to come into the mainstream uh, as well as those businesses that have been choosing it before. So what is it? Um, I'll talk about standards Wednesday. So if you hold fire for that until Wednesday. What is it and why do we need to look at the strategic approach to managing knowledge assets, which we call CAM? As I say, I teach it in Cambridge on the River Cam. So I teach CAM on the CAM. That's, uh, <laughs> it's very good, actually. I mean, I still have this job title, you know. Chief Knowledge Officer. Doesn't that sound grand? And uh, I thought to myself, oh, if, one, when, if I was a young boy, if I would have known one day I'm going to be a Chief Knowledge Officer, I'd be quite proud of that. So I was quite proud, and I was going to America, and I got my business card, which actually says Chief Knowledge Officer, and I gave it to this lady on the West Coast, I won't say what company, and she gave me her card, which was Chief Wisdom Officer. <laughs> uh, I've got some more to learn. What do we mean by this? Why so much fuss? Well, let me just tell you a very quick true story that happened in one of the clients that we were implementing knowledge asset management. This is a big energy group, 30 companies in the Middle East. And I was talking with the head of research and development, and he showed me a keyboard, just an ordinary keyboard. And he turned the keyboard upside down, and there was a sticker on it. And the sticker had a little reference number. And he said, once a year, somebody comes around, and they ask to see the keyboard. They turn it over. They look at the reference number, check it on the database, and tick it off. And that keyboard costs about 20 US dollars. And he said, they've been doing this for 10 years. And this is part of their asset management procedure. But for the last same 10 years, behind him in the bookcase was a patent, the very first patent that they got, a US patent. It's worth millions and millions of millions, but nobody in the organization has ever come up to him and asked to see this patent, or even knows it exists. The difference is it's an intangible asset which is so badly neglected in our modern management today. Tangible assets we're pretty good at. We can manage the keyboards. Intangible assets, we're not sure. Now, intangible asset management is synonymous to knowledge asset management. It's whatever term you prefer. An intangible asset, a knowledge asset. They're the important things. Let me just try to explain it this way. Think about physical asset management, which is the top three pictures, and knowledge asset management, or intangible asset management, which are the bottom three pictures. If you take electricity, if you're managing electricity, electricity is a bit like knowledge, isn't it? You can't see it. You can't see it. But you have to manage a national electricity grid. Of course, what you're really managing, first of all, are those things that generate electricity, the generators. They are key assets 
The generators of electricity are key assets, and they can be managed well, measured and managed and reported on. You must keep your generators managed. And then electricity has to be distributed. And you may well use overhead pylons and cables or underground or other things. But they are tangible and measurable assets that can be managed and measured. And we're good at that. And then we have to apply the electricity. And we apply the electricity into a variety of devices. It could be to light up this building or it could be into a home vacuum cleaner. These are all tangible. They're all measurable. But they are assets that generate, distribute, and apply electricity. You're not necessarily managing the electricity. You're managing the assets that create, distribute, and apply electricity. That's all we're saying with knowledge asset management. Knowledge is a key asset. It's the valuable knowledge, as we've all said, is in the heads of the people and always will be. What we manage are those assets in the organization that generate knowledge. Those assets in the organization that distribute knowledge. Those assets in the organizations that apply knowledge. They are tangible. They are measurable. They are manageable. That's, and so you can see in the bottom three pictures, generators of knowledge are people. And the most powerful generators of knowledge we've learned are teams. And you know there's a lot of research on high-performing teams, over 50 years of research. But it was only in the late 1980s when collaborative technologies appeared that we started to look at collaboration in a new way. Up until then, a collaborative team means a group of people working together to achieve a common objective. That's a good definition of collaboration. But once collaborative technologies came out, which enabled people to virtually communicate, collaborate, learn, and share, we realized something quite startling. And that is this. A collaborative team is the best creator of new knowledge in any organization. Collaborative teams generate new knowledge, create new knowledge. Collaborative teams are generators. Of course, individual experts are generators of knowledge. Collaborative teams are powerful generators. Many people say, how can our organization become more creative? How can our organization become more innovative? Well, if they do nothing else than introduce and develop collaborative teams, they will become more creative, more innovative, because that's the byproduct of collaboration. Collaborative teamwork. So this is just an example in the bottom here of one form of generator, a collaborative team. The way we distribute, of course, we can distribute across the World Wide Web. But let me take opportunity just to remind us that knowledge management is not just about sharing knowledge. Many companies made huge mistakes in the early days just trying to go to share knowledge. Knowledge management to us is sharing knowledge when there is benefit in sharing and better protecting knowledge when there is benefit in protecting. It's a combination and it's knowing when to share and when to when not. It's knowing when to compete and when to collaborate. That's what SMART really is. And so we can distribute, we can generate, and we can distribute, and we can apply our knowledge in exactly the same way using the analogy of electricity. The big difference is we can identify who are the knowledge assets and categorize them and report on them. So that's when knowledge asset management was born with those sort of principles. It contains 
a framework, a methodology, and uses all the latest technologies, whether they're cloud-based, whether it's big data, whether it's machine intelligence, whatever. We use the technologies that are best to do the job. So the framework, what's centric, it's a knowledge asset centric framework where we focus people in the organization on the key knowledge assets that we need to develop and manage. And the outer ring is what we call the flow of knowledge, which is the individuals, the teams, the organization, across the organization. This is how it flows. Here are the methods. There are lots of methods and tools and diagnostic tools to assess where we are now and to move forward. And then it's the application of the tools and the technologies. So briefly, and I can only briefly introduce it, how do we go about it? How do we categorize them? But there is a de facto standard. It's been in existence for many years. And those of you that work in intellectual capital will know it already. This de facto, de facto standard says there are three types of knowledge assets that we need to identify and measure and manage. And the first, of course, are human knowledge assets, the most important. When you say to people knowledge assets, they immediately think of codified information. We don't mean that. We mean people and processes and technologies. They're all assets to create knowledge, distribute knowledge, and apply knowledge. Human will always be the most important. The second we call structural knowledge assets. These are the assets that we capture knowledge and codify it or document it, whatever you want. And let me make a, a, a point here, because already we've had some discussions about what's information and what's knowledge. The way we view it is as follows. I have knowledge in my head. If I write a book, I have made my knowledge explicit. I know the subject, I understand, I've got experience, and I make my knowledge explicit. If you don't know the subject, if you're wanting to learn it, it's not knowledge to you, it's not explicit knowledge to you, it's information to you. Because you have to go through the learning process. You have to decide, and what is the learning process? The learning process is one which says, here's some information, do I want to, am I interested in it? Do I believe it? And you critically review it, and you learn it, and you go through the process of learning to turn it into your tacit knowledge. So we make that very simple distinction, that what is explicit knowledge to me, my knowledge in my book, as a sender of knowledge to the receiver is information, unless they already know. If they already know, then that's fine. Is that OK? Will you accept that? Because that's the basic principle uh, that we use for tacit and explicit. It's not just about information. It's not just about knowledge. It's about information, learning processes, and knowledge. Information, learning, and knowledge. It's not just about knowledge and innovation. It's about knowledge, creativity, innovation, and innovation management. On Wednesday, when I talk about the ISO standard, one of the first things we had to do was to get consensus on where does information management stop and where does knowledge management start? And where does knowledge management stop and where does innovation management start? And we came to the conclusion that information and knowledge and innovation you need to, you need to, I'll go into it in more detail, but essentially, as far as we're concerned, I've already said that what's information to one person, if they go through the learning process, becomes knowledge. Then we can manage that as an asset. But when you create knowledge as a collaborative team or as an individual, 
Creating new knowledge is still part of knowledge management, but when you create this new knowledge and ideas and put it into a systematic process to develop products and services, that's innovation management. And I'll go more into that on Wednesday. As I say, this standard, we've completed the draft. It's going to public consultation in a few weeks. So if you disagree with anything that I present on Wednesday, please let us know because you will influence the ISO standard development. Because we have to take all the public feedback and incorporate it and consider it. So let's take it a bit further. Human knowledge assets are people. What are the key human knowledge assets, the key human generators? Experts, collaborative teams, communities. You've heard about the networks from Larry this morning, you know, what were recognized in that second generation. Experts, collaborative teams, and communities can all be measured. What are the key structural knowledge assets? Well, those things that are critical in the organization. What do we mean by critical? We mean the following. What knowledge, if we could better manage it, would make the biggest difference to achieving our objectives? It's as simple as that. What knowledge, if we really, really could manage it better, would make the biggest difference to achieving our objectives? That's what we mean by critical knowledge. And that which we can codify and document is structural. And we can measure it. And then the third category is what some call market knowledge assets, some call relational or social or societal. It's the same thing. The first two categories, human knowledge assets, individuals, teams, and communities, and structural knowledge assets, they are within the organization. However, the third category is the knowledge and the knowledge assets that reside outside the organization. And a lot of organizations initially, they concentrate just on how can we manage our knowledge. But as Larry said this morning, quite rightly, it's a societal thing. And actually, it then dawns on people that the value is in the knowledge ecosystem. It's what's out there, not just what's in our organizations. It's in our networks, it's in our partnerships, it's with our customers, it's with our clients, it's with our competitors. And that's this third category, which we can identify, manage, and measure. And INSEAD Business School did some really good work on this. INSEAD Business School looked at these three categories, which are all contained within this area here. Human, structural, and market. And all the measurements that are recommended for how we approach this are all in the book. And they also linked it with something else which a lot of senior management spend a lot of time on, which is financial assets. And how do they relate? How do human knowledge assets relate to financial, to structural, to market? Let me take a simple example. A software developer, a coder. A software developer is a human knowledge asset. When that software developer develops an app, it becomes a very powerful structural asset. That structural asset can actually work with the market, with the customers, and to turn into cash. Very simple, but there are strong relationships between human, structural, market, and financial assets that you can actually measure and manage. As I say, some organizations are horrified by the thought of measurement and standards. Some organizations and some industry sectors cannot operate unless they can manage and measure. So it's what's right for you and your organizations. Conscious of the time, so just a few more minutes. I just want to introduce the subject. If, if this interests you, I can give you lots of links and get the book, and you can go much further. And I'm here for the rest of the week anyway. So knowledge asset management, in summary, means Imagine an organization that has only manages its financial assets well. And let's say it's valued at 100 million US dollars. And its accounting system can account for the 
tangible assets and it has $10 million worth of tangible, measurable assets on its books, but it has a stock market value of $100 million, therefore there must be $90 million in tangible. We don't know what it is. The accountants don't know what to do with it, so they call it goodwill. Okay? Knowledge asset management is saying, you can go further. In addition to your financial assets, you can identify, which are these little red things here, the knowledge assets, the critical knowledge assets. And you can categorize them into human knowledge assets, structural and market knowledge assets. And then you can apply the methodology which understands the relationship and knowledge management principles to grow those knowledge assets into larger, hopefully, financial, human, structural, and market. That's in very simple terms uh, what it does. But there is a deep methodology behind it. For those of you that are looking for tools, techniques, assessment tools, diagnostic tools, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, I've, I will just briefly spend a second on some of them. But if you're going to develop a strategy, which is something, a knowledge asset management strategy, look at the current business context first of all. Each of these boxes is actually a separate exercise. This first box answers the question, why do we want to do this? Why? Why do we actually want to manage our knowledge assets? And therefore, a compelling business case must be made. If you can't make a compelling business case, forget it. Why? Who are the stakeholders? Standard stakeholders management. What is the critical knowledge? And what are the critical knowledge areas that will make the biggest difference? And what are the critical knowledge assets within those areas that will make a difference? Then, what are the risks of sharing? I've briefly said it's not just about sharing, it's about knowing when to best share and when to best protect. When we've identified the knowledge assets, we do a knowledge sharing risk assessment on them to see the benefits and the costs and the compelling case for doing so. We have surveys uh, where we can find out what people believe, what their perceptions are. We look at the current infrastructure and the technologies that exist in the organization today. And the biggest one is, how ready is this organization for the, this change, culture? How ready are they for the change? Are they, do they have the right mindset? Do they have the right technology? Are they uh, able to do this? You know, we talk about three paradigms in knowledge management. When I go into an organization, they're in either paradigm one, two, or three. Paradigm one is, if you ask people, they say, oh, knowledge management is a great idea. Yeah, I can, I, I, I can intellectually agree with you. But I'm so busy, I, I don't have time to do my real job. I don't even have time to do the work I've got to do. I, I, I can't share knowledge. That's the normal majority of people in organizations. And the biggest question I get asked when I go around the world is, why should I share my knowledge? My knowledge is my value. Paradigm two is when people start to examine this and understand it and say, yeah, knowledge is an important resource. I agree. And we must look at better ways to work with this and improve it and manage and apply it. Knowledge is important resource. That's paradigm two. That's being knowledge-based. It's recognizing a higher value for knowledge. But the one we're looking for is paradigm three. Paradigm three is knowledge is the key asset in the organization. It drives and underpins everything else we do. And actually, knowledge is for everyone. This is for everyone. This is not a special department or anything like this. It's something we all have to do. And we all have to be engaged in. We do all of that sort of stuff there. Um, that's just the first development of the strategy. And then we always, always, always recommend pilot. Do not consider that you roll this out across the whole organization. Take a small pilot as a project 
show the compelling business case, see the business value it produces, then do the next one, then do the next one, then do the next one. And what actually happens is when you do enough, when you get a critical mass in the organization of these successful people start to change their mindset. It becomes the way we do things around here and the culture changes. You can audit this. I'll talk about auditors and standards on Wednesday. But you can audit the current business process. Oops, sorry. I'm, current business process and how we can design an improved, innovative, breakthrough process with knowledge. You can analyze the networks of people and leverage the knowledge within the networks of the people. You can look at your existing technologies and look at the new miraculous technologies that are appearing by the day and how they can leverage the knowledge. But the key thing is, they're all knowledge assets. And we can actually develop in the organization a knowledge asset portfolio or a knowledge asset directory, just like we have a portfolio of tangible assets, and we can report on them, and we can work with them. So just to summarize, identify the mission critical knowledge assets. What are the key knowledge assets that if we could manage them better would make the biggest difference? Focus on that. Human, structural, and market. Develop a strategy aligned to your corporate objectives. That's already been mentioned in the earlier presentation. There is also an ISO standard, ISO 55000, that exists today for tangible asset management. If you look at that standard within it, it tells you how to develop a strategic asset management plan. We are now working in that standard to show how you can develop a strategic knowledge asset management plan to do it. And then, when you have the strategy, then you can leverage the assets just like any other assets. It's just good, solid asset management. And you can measure, and you can manage, and you can report. So that's my time up. I hope that I've given you an insight into one of the approaches, knowledge asset management, focusing on the critical knowledge assets. There are methodologies around to do it. And uh, I don't know if we've got any, have we got any time for questions or are we out of time? We are running a little late, but perhaps we can take the time for it one or maximum two questions. If, if you have any burning ones, otherwise, again, Ron will be available during coffee break. So, any questions? Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Indan. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm interesting when you uh, Tell us about uh, knowledge access management methodolog methodology state one. I was wonder uh, about the methodology, methodology uh, the data collection, how 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 the data is collected. Is it use a quantitative or qualitative method? And then if it's use a quantitative. Uh, I mean, maybe like interview, or uh, you you put a form uh, answering. How to make that uh, data collective to be more uh, objective? Because when you interviewing people and you jump a conclusion from that interview, it's uh, got subjective, you know. Okay, that's mm. all. Yeah, uh, you're talking about data analysis, and you're look, talking about quantitative and qualitative measurements for data analysis. Um, I'm really talking about looking at, for example, the human being as an, as, as an asset to be managed. We're not just extracting knowledge. We're not just trying to capture. We're just saying, how can we optimize that asset that we have in our organization today? And that involves more than just capturing stuff. We want to capture 
the critical stuff because human beings move on and organizations need to retain critical knowledge, especially in the nuclear industry, which is one of your key challenges, knowledge retention. Uh, but it's a bit more than data. But perhaps you could come back to me after my presentations tomorrow and Wednesday. And if I haven't gone into that sufficiently for you, uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Jude. Um, I was hoping, I uh, want to ask if you can give uh, an example of a structural asset. I found it very difficult to be able to actually... Yeah, okay, yeah, right. Good question. I mean, a strategy is a very valuable piece of knowledge that's been encoded for the benefit of others. A, str a strategy as a document is a structural knowledge asset. A corporate policy uh, operating procedures, best practices, software, copyrights, they are all structural knowledge assets. But there's a great exhaustive list I can point you to. Not only is there the book that I'd like you to get, but I can point you on the web to examples of each of those categories that you can consider if they work for you. Great. Thank you very much, Ron, okay. for the very insightful presentation. Okay. I think now we can dwell more on uh, aspects related to managing nuclear knowledge with... Uh